We're very honored, and I'm very particularly pleased to introduce uh, the senior senator from Indiana, Dan Coates. Dan and I were having a conversation, we're catching up on things that we knew something about in the past in our association. We served together eight years in the U.S. House of Representatives. He's a good friend. He was then uh, appointed to the United States Senate and uh, won re-election to the Senate in 1990 and again in 1992 and just established a distinguished record there. Went on back to the private sector and did great things there as well, as well as public service. And then he was appointed as one of our key ambassadorial posts, uh, our ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany. We have always sent our very best people to Bonn and to Berlin because of Germany's importance in our relationship with it. And Dan did really an outstanding job there, entered that line of distinguished Americans that have served us so well in that post. He returned to the Senate, uh, elected again in 2010, and uh, he has served on the Senate Armed Service Committee, the Select and the Joint Committees on Intelligence, and the Senate Finance Committee. He uh, currently chairs, as I understand it, the Joint Economic Committee and the Finance Committee's Subcommittee on Energy, Natural Resources, and Infrastructure. Uh, a great gentleman, a fine person, a great senator, a good public servant, that's for sure. And he's going to have the pleasure of introducing one of his fellow distinguished Hoosiers here in a minute. So please welcome Senator Dan Coates. Doug, thank you very much. Uh, my former colleague, uh, we spent, uh, as he said, eight years together. Dan Glickman's in the audience. Uh, he was also a fellow colleague. You're a privilege to have uh, two distinguished people whose uh, uh, service has not only been important uh, for our country, but whose hearts are engaged uh, with what you're doing, which is pretty phenomenal, and I commend you for it. It is, as uh, Doug said, an honor uh, to introduce a longtime friend, Purdue University President Mitch Daniels. I'm one of many who would hope to be able to uh, drop the word Purdue and just say introduce President Mitch Daniels. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Mitch is serving as governor of our state for eight years, eight remarkable years of unprecedented leadership. He has demonstrated through his many years of public service an amazing intellect, visionary ideas, and strong leadership. But he's probably best known to Hoosiers as just that guy who campaigned for governor by driving around the state in an RV, eating pork tenderloins everywhere he stopped, and trust me, in Indiana politics, if you don't like pork tenderloins, don't run for office. <laughs> Mitch will be forever linked to that ever so radical idea of daylight savings time, first suggested by Ben Franklin, 200 years later implemented in Indiana by Mitch despite a torrent of criticism from Hoosiers that were upset about making changes so quickly. <clears throat> of course, today we cherish that, those of us who enjoy golf, because we can now tee off at uh, 5 p.m. and finish 18 holes before sundown. So um, one of the many things Mitch will be remembered for. Before he served as governor, Mitch worked, as many of you know, Director of Office of Management and Budget under President George W. Bush who affectionately called him the Blade. Uh, his bona fides as a fiscal hawk are legendary in Indiana uh, and nationally. The story goes that as a young man, he once fished quarters out of a toilet to pay for a beer. The question here is, how old were you, Mitch, when you were so desperate for a beer that you were pulling quarters out of a toilet? <clears throat> He's also known, I told him, by the way, this would be part of a roast in terms of, uh, as well as an introduction. He said that's okay. He's also known for venturing into the woods to find every golf ball he hits off the course, which I'm told are, are a fair number. Uh, but it was in January 2013 when he took over Purdue University as president. And he's guided that university through a period of innovative reform and transformation both cutting costs, improving services, and freezing tuition 
to the delight of parents and the distress of tenured professors. Now, we all know that the success of any university president is largely measured by the performance of the football team and the basketball team. And as an Indiana University graduate, I'm happy to report that Mitch has much work to do in these particular <laughs> areas. Who knew that when he once spoke about a new red menace, Mitch was actually referring to the IU football team and not our national debt. In addition to addressing global health issues, this task force is examining the role of U.S. policy in low and middle income countries, including how agriculture and our food systems can play greater roles in promoting health and nutrition worldwide. Based on the many and based on the litany of professional accomplishments, Mitch Daniels was recently named to Fortune Magazine's 2015 list of the world's 50 greatest leaders. And those of us who are privileged to live in the Hoosier State think Mitch absolutely deserves to be part of that list. Please join me in welcoming this visionary leader, President Mitch Daniels. I'm starting this luncheon off in a deep, deep hole. <laughs> Thanks to Coates. I mean, being introduced to a group of knowledgeable, nutritionally virtuous <laughs> people like you as a fan of tenderloins, which I am, you know, I was thinking, I was trying to imagine what that even faintly resembles. You know, maybe being introduced to uh, the board of the New York Philharmonic as a rap music fan, I don't know. <laughs> but not, not the best start I could have gotten off to. The, um, I don't know where you dug up the quarters story, Dan. Turn, it is totally true. <laughs> Happened in the Tune In, which is about, which is less than a mile from where we're convened right here. But it had nothing to do with desperation. Simple thrift. A Hoosier virtue you may have forgotten about, I don't know. So despite the uh, beginning with such uh, uh, coats inflicted handicap, I am very, very deeply pleased to be here. I come both with a sense of, of gratification. This is uh, among the nation's most important and prestigious organizations of its kind, has been for a long, long time, and, and this particular forum now in it's, uh, I guess, sixth or seventh year, something like that, already one of the most watched, uh, most followed, most read events of its kind. And um, I, I, I'm stunned at the all-star lineup that's been assembled uh, to uh, talk about uh, what now I, uh, folks on uh, campuses like ours like to refer to as one of the grand challenges of our century. Um, what's new about that? Feeding. Hungry people has been the grand challenge of every century and, uh, and uh, since humankind's been around, and it's still our greatest one. So to be a part of this uh, gathering of uh, people far more experienced, far more knowledgeable than I about these issues is uh, something I approach, uh, I, I, let me confess to having approached it with a little hesitation. Uh, I consider this one of those ex officio speeches. In other words, you get invited not for what you know, but for the job you hold. And on that basis, uh, now that I uh, represent, help represent Purdue University, uh, there's every reason in the world to, to say yes and to be, be here and try to say something uh, value added amid so many genuine experts. You know, I, it, this has uh, been a real change of life uh, for me. And not like the last couple, not something I necessarily saw coming. I've told other people about this that uh, on the day it was announced, a, a good friend in New York City, his wife is an extraordinarily successful, long-time uh, figure in the publishing world, knows everybody, uh, everybody hangs out with, I don't know, Barbara Walters and people like that, sophisticated woman of the world, and he goes home and says, you hear the news about Mitch? And she said, no, what? He said, he's going to be president of Purdue. She said, I think that is just terrible. <laughs> he said, why? I think it's, it's kind of cool. She said, 
His talents will be totally wasted in the chicken business. <laughs> but in truth, till arriving at Purdue, I, hadn't, I had only a, an attentive citizen's maybe acquaintance with agricultural and food issues and uh, learned a lot, however, in the last couple years. But I, let me just establish, let's just stipulate at the outset that uh, I may not belong in a list of experts like those that have been assembled by the by the council here, but uh, Purdue does. We are at work all the time and have been since our founding close to a century and a half ago uh, on the challenges of, of uh, feeding uh, a hungry world. We are work on every uh, front of that struggle uh, from productivity. My friend Gabiza Jetta is here, our most recent World Food Prize winner. Uh, his sorghum has saved lives of countless uh, citizens of Ethiopia and other African countries. Purdue has been at, at the forefront, I think I can contend safely, uh, in uh, challenging the, in facing the challenge of wasted food, that one-fifth by some estimates of, of the food, more than a gigaton, I'm, I read, that uh, doesn't make it from, from farm to fork. Uh, what we refer to as PICS, Purdue Improved Crop Storage System, by uh, eliminating loss to uh, pests at less than a penny a pound has uh, uh, led to enormous increases in available food, um, a variety of, of, uh, of uh, kinds. Uh, another of our recent World Food Prize winners, Phil Nelson, uh, pioneered the better storage of vegetables and fresh fruits. Uh, just a few years ago, and his technology is being used all over the world, uh, like like uh, Gabiza's. And in terms of capacity building, we uh, we just marked, of course, the sesquicentennial of the assassination of uh, America's greatest president. Some of us think um, one of his many acts of of uh, genius was with allies to create the land grant system of which Purdue is a proud early uh, uh, member of that fraternity. And to me, one of the great joys of the assignment that has now come to me is to um, uh, represent the land-grant ethic and to pursue it in, in, two, in its two principal tenets. One, uh, to throw open the gates of education beyond the wealthy, beyond the privileged, beyond the children of the elites. And this is something we take very seriously at Purdue. It's what tuition freezes and, and other actions like that are about. But the, of course, the other great assignment was to specialize, not exclusively, but to specialize in fostering new learning and new technology in the tools of a growing country. Uh, the mechanic arts was one, and that's why we're one of the world's great engineering schools today. But of course, the other was agriculture. And throughout its history, like so many other of our, of our counterparts, you know, Purdue has always seen this as perhaps the noblest assignment that we have, and we pursue it very actively, including trying to spread that notion the land-grant notion beyond the shores of this country where it was born, and, and to build capacity. Uh, as, as far back as a half century ago, Purdue per, uh, participated very directly in the, uh, in the foundation of Brazil's first agriculture university. And we continue to this day and are working with African countries now who, are, uh, who want to come to that, to bring that same institution uh, to their own nations. Uh, we believe strongly, uh, as did Lincoln, that self-help is, uh, is the way not only to most, the most effective human progress, but to the progress most consistent with human dignity. George Carlin was a, was a figure that I miss on the comedic scene. I remember George, Carlin once said he went in a bookstore and asked for the self-help section, and the clerk said, sir, don't you think that would defeat the purpose? But in general, uh, self-help is our ethic, and we believe will be the ethic of success in, uh, in uh, meeting that grandest of challenges, feeding 
eight to nine billion people before we know it. Now, uh, uh, I do have a credential of a different sort, and happily for me that my assignment, my specific assignment from the council today is a little different than others, and that was to speak to you very briefly about a uh, project in which I uh, was enlisted not too long ago by a, uh, a partner organization, I hope that's the way you think of it, the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, uh, I approached th uh, that project with a great deal of reluctance because it was another subject I didn't feel, number one, particularly expert in, number two, I wasn't sure I agreed with the premise. Uh, I do now, having learned an awful lot, and I'm going to share a little bit of it with you. But the report, if you haven't read it or heard about it, the emerging global health crisis, non-communicable diseases in low and middle income countries. and. Um, I, as I say, I only agreed to take on this extracurricular task because of my great respect for that organization and for Richard Haas, its leader. I, I was really worried for a good bit of time that I couldn't be an enthusiastic participant, I, that I wouldn't be persuaded that with all the other problems low and middle income countries are facing, starting with hunger and, and malnutrition, but, uh, you know, including, for, of course, the whole panoply of infectious diseases with which we're uh, all more familiar, that uh, uh, I, wouldn't, I couldn't, with uh, a, a full and clear enthusiasm, uh, sign on to this report. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that uh, I'm better educated now. And I think this report makes a contribution, a contribution uh, linked more closely than I might have thought to the work you're about right here. So let me just take you very quickly uh, through uh, what we uh, looked at and where we came out. I think the, the report really seeks to change and broaden the conversation. When we've thought about health care and health problems in, uh, in developing countries, naturally enough, we have thought about infectious diseases. Malaria remains a, 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 a tragic killer. Uh, fast mutating parasite that, that uh, continues to confound and often defeat successive uh, therapies. I'm happy to tell you, by the way, that one of our most brilliant researchers at Purdue may have a whole new mechanism for malaria. I'm so hoping that he's right. The, but the idea he has hit on is in, instead of trying to kill the parasite, which mutates in, uh, its way around uh, such treatments, uh, he's found a way to trap it within the cell where it propagates, keep it from using the cell's own mechanisms to break down the cell wall and therefore perhaps to die in place. If this works, we may finally have an enduring treatment uh, for this uh, terrible killer. But we think historically, I think most of us have thought mainly about malaria and tuberculosis and, of course, uh, HIV, and uh, perhaps the most uh, uh, successful and uh, important uh, collective act efforts on the on the global healthcare scene have been uh, in those areas. PEPFAR, uh, most uh, most memorably and recently. Um, but to summarize the findings, which have changed my mind, and I hope will change the conversation to some extent around this whole area of global health concerns. First of all, that non-communicable diseases are the fastest spreading, are spreading very rapidly uh, in uh, lesser developed countries and in a very um, pernicious and dangerous way. They are spreading most rapidly among younger populations and among emerging middle class populations, exactly the sort of working age people that a that a, that a growing, younger, de developing country needs uh, to be successful. Um, this phenomenon is only partly explained. Some of us thought, well, it's just the consequences of success. You know, a little extra money, lots more protein, fatty meals. You know, this is, yes, this is a factor. Better uh, um, uh, infant mortality uh, uh, treatment, greater longevity, this is just a natural consequence. The data say not, not so, only a partial explanation. Obesity is rising quickly in these countries, but it's at levels far below 
those in the West. And yet, the diseases we associate with obesity are rising uh, very, very rapidly, and they're killing people or disabling them um, at younger ages than we see here. By, by one estimation, by the way, this is a very data-rich report. There are two things different about this uh, than I'm told than uh, many, many excellent products of the CFR in the past. One is this is their first uh, report on a health care issue, or so we were uh, told. And secondly, at the insistence of some of us, it is very data rich. And, and those of you who are at all interested in this will find rather quickly and readily in here, uh, I think, some uh, facts and figures that will persuade you, as it did many of us on the commission, that this phenomenon is real and it's as important as, as the, the original um, proponents of the study suggested. There are other, because there are other factors involved, specifically uh, urbanization, Com com combined with new longevity, um, it has created a situation in which uh, the health care problems of many of these countries are outrunning, outpacing the health care infrastructure of these countries to deal with those problems. And that's why they're more severe. And given the, the age and the uh, significance of the populations being, uh, being afflicted, it's a really uh, it's a menace to the progress which is otherwise so encouraging in most corners uh, in advances against poverty and so forth in most corners of the world. The World Economic Forum, uh, by, by their estimate, $21 trillion will be lost to non-communicable diseases in those countries in the next two decades. That equates essentially to the loss of a year. That's, what, that's the combined GDP of the countries we categorize as L uh, DCs uh, in the current year. It would be a devastating loss if allowed to happen. Um, we think we saw some things that can be done about this. And uh, one thing I appreciated about my fellow commissioners, uh, one of whom I'm going to praise here in just a minute, being one of your own, um, was that having first been convinced by the data that this phenomenon is real, it warrants a global attention and concerted action. I think we were pretty cautious and not to lapse into that uh, all too human uh, 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 failing of uh, recommending everything and recommending things that were just impossible of, of accomplishment. Um, and so the recommendations in the, in the report uh, don't pretend to be complete solutions, but they are, we think, practical, they are affordable, they are actionable. So this let me mention some of the, uh, uh, the, the, first of all, the criteria we applied were, were that the, the actions ought to be aimed at working age populations, for the reasons I gave. They ought to be targetable with existing, proven, low-cost technologies, therefore scalable, as people like to say these days that they ought to be amenable to collective action by the international community, and they ought to leverage wherever possible existing infrastructure, especially that the U.S. has put in place to deal with AIDS and other um, uh, uh, health care challenges we've, we've tackled in the past. Um, there's some pretty profound implications if any of this was taken seriously. Let me just give you one uh, factoid that I know uh, stayed with many of us that speaks to the, the reprioritization that will be necessary if we're going to do really tackle this NCD problem. Using the conventional measurement of dollies, I guess we say, disability adjusted, but basically life years saved. In the most recent year, we spent more than $44 on AIDS. We spent more than $4 per life on malaria around $2 per life on TB, less than two cents on all NCDs put together. So with even some shift of priority, we could, we could multiply substantially the effort. Where would, we, where would where did we recommend starting on what will need to be eventually a broader and long-term <laughs> project? Uh, on, we picked three or four diseases which seem to meet those tests I just laid out. Cardiovascular disease, antihypertensives, 
Uh, ACE inhibitors and other families are available now, as you know, generically for cents a day. We know they work. They're, they're hardly used in many of the countries that we looked at. Big, big upside for very, very little money uh, if uh, we were able to uh, bring them to bear in a big way. Uh, two cancers, liver cancer, more prevalent than you would think, very damaging and very debilitating and very expensive when it happens. Uh, we have hepatitis B vaccine that's effective and that's affordable. Cervical cancer, uh, a killer and disabler of women in, in unacceptable levels. In many of these countries, we have uh, both uh, simple screening te uh, techniques that ought to be expandable or in, you know, implementable. And we have the human papilloma virus uh, uh, vaccine, uh, which is now proven and available and affordable. And the fourth big category, tobacco control. And we know how to approach that. This, this verges over in a different territory. People will have to make a policy decision, but higher prices work. I know it. I saw it at the state level, financed a financed the program for un uninsured, low-income uninsured people by raising the tobacco tax and saw the, the uh, use of tobacco uh, drop dramatically as we have in other places. Overall, I think our commission feels that we produced a sound report, but it had a major flaw. And Commissioner Dan Glickman was the one who pointed it out. And his additional views uh, at the back of the report in some, to some extent, maybe as important as any other page uh, in the whole book. Yes, uh, the report does say that dietary factors are the leading cause among many for the problems that are cataloged and quantified and outlined here. But Dan, I absolutely correctly says that the report gives too short a shrift to their importance and to the possibilities of including them in the strategies the early strategies for addressing this problem. Uh, the poor nutrition and malnutrition uh, connect both directly and then indirectly to some of the diseases we're most worried about, diabetes being an obvious case, can certain cancers uh, likewise. So thinking ahead to today, uh, I, I, I wanted to you know, honor the assignment to bring this report to your attention, but now, having just in the last day or so read your report. I see these, uh, we ought to make a box set or, <laughs> <laughs> I think they, and maybe Dan is the linchpin that, that brought this together, but I, I think read together, uh, they, they, they make a genuine contribution to uh, identifying a problem we may not have paid enough attention to and demonstrating uh, the ways in which better nutrition, uh, 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 an attack on a, a more successful attack on, on world hunger and world um, and poor nutrition uh, globally, uh, can uh, can address those underattended problems. Let me just close with a couple last thoughts. Um, uh, really, on behalf of my uh, hunger fighting uh, colleagues uh, from Purdue. As, as this report and, uh, and many other illustrations uh, would make plain, uh, so many of the problems that we must address and must help our brothers and sisters and the rest of the world address uh, with regard to human privation and poverty are, um, uh, uh, can be approached with existing technologies. And um, yet, um, we all know, I hope we do, that we will need to meet the grand challenge. We will need new technologies and improved technologies and their rapid uh, adaptation whenever they have been proven. And at Purdue, we're so proud of the people we have, Gabiza and many, many colleagues working on low water, low pesticide, low fertilizer uh, breeds. We're very excited about a vitamin A enriched corn that could begin to reduce the quarter to half a million children a year who go blind and often die from vitamin A deficiency. Um, we're investing tens of millions of dollars in our new Center for Molecular Agriculture, including um, 
the, the world's most advanced, as far as I know, field phenotyping lab, literally to scan in real time. You bring the power of big data to bear, coupled with unmanned aerial vehicles collecting the data, uh, to bear on the question of which of millions of slightly different varieties is, is prospering most in the real world, this, this sort of thing. And we're not the only place doing this, but I'm just trying to express to you the the depth of our commitment, the fact that we, th we think this is, is so important to our heritage and to the ne needs of today. But the, the thought I'd leave you with, I hope it's one that's obvious in this room of experts, that yes, we will, we will meet the needs of nine billion people. We absolutely can do this. The Malthusian confusion will apparently be with us as long as Homo sapiens is around. Doesn't matter how often it's refuted. Doesn't matter how embarrassed its, its prophets of doom are. People get genius awards and sell millions of books for being unbelievably, pathetically wrong. <laughs> but if it were just the professional pessimists we had to deal with, that would be a an irritation, almost sometimes an amusement. Now, there's something worse, of course. Uh, creeping into the debates in the last decade or two or three has been a degree of, I think, disregard for scientific evidence, an anti-science of the most dangerous kind. And, the, and those, those kind of people those who would deny struggling and up-and-coming nations the benefits of the best technology that can be discovered at Purdue or any place else on the globe really must be confronted and asked to think twice. This sort of mentality may be an indulgence that the richest countries can afford, but when imposed or if imposed on countries struggling to feed themselves who might do so through the, the blessings of modern technology, it becomes some to my way of thinking, not merely senseless, but heartless and inhumane and unacceptable. But I take heart knowing that there are organizations like your council holding meetings like this, full of knowledgeable and influential voices like yours. And when I see a room like this, I have every conference. Yes, again, mankind will meet its challenges. We will uh, confound the pessimists. We will feed and share the blessings of, that we all enjoy with a hungry and deserving world. Thank you for the chance to be with you.